welcome to chapter 5 which is on networking internet and web technologies basically what's a network i think we all are familiar with networks we've been using them the fundamental reasons why networks evolved as you can see from the slide here is essentially as a means of sharing sharing what sharing data sharing information sharing expensive uh, devices for example an expensive laser printer or a fast uh, printer that you might have or simply sharing software and programs so there's concurrent users of the program in that case also you have uh, a whole lot of cost associated with an IT infrastructure sharing of any kind helps reducing costs and therefore networks become a cost effective means of doing business uh, more than that I think the whole of internet and the whole of uh, networking which has come up has actually transformed the way we do business and that's I think a bigger, better impact you would also notice that human beings as part of organizations as also part of social life tend to network with each other so it's a human inter interaction which needs to be facilitated and networks help you to do that what are the components of a network one of course you find a number of computers uh, which are hooked on to the network and how are they hooked on there typically there's a card which is known as the network interface card which enables you to connect a wire or the bus which goes across the network and hook the machine onto it uh, through a port. Uh, we typically fit an eth Ethernet card which is uh, known as a network interface card and that's the foundation of networking. But the other side of it is a server, a server which probably caters to all the requirements of various clients in terms of networking, in terms of communication, in terms of sharing of devices, in terms of defining roles for others within the network space and that's what a server does. Uh, the server itself is a slightly complicated piece of software and also it runs on a separate hardware typically because of performance reasons and uh, it can contain a lot of information about users who are on the network, the kind of programs that are being run, it probably connects you to databases which are also stored on the same server or maybe different servers and this helps you to share a whole lot of things on the network. Uh, it's also an intelligent device which routes the message to the appropriate path and because the network uh, is such that packets of data move along the network somebody has to take uh, the action as to directing the pa packets to the right place uh, the various components that exist on the network uh, are the terms used and associated with a network one for example is a gateway and typically when you have two different kinds of networks and you're trying to connect them what you have as an interface is known as a gateway. Uh, a similar thing exists in terms of a bridge but bridge is typically within the same network or the same type of a network and then you have another word which we sometimes use which is a switch which is essentially nothing but uh, something which within a network helps exchange data for example if you have a five story building and uh, on every story there is one local area network but all of the networks are actually connected to a common uh, server or a set of servers through a common switch so traffic to and fro each of these networks is actually uh, regulated by the switch itself so the switch directs traffic to the right kind of LAN so is it for the first floor is it for the second floor etc and that's what a switch does likewise if the traffic is meant for a particular server it directs and interfaces with the server as well a hub is also a similar term which is used so if you see these terms are similar but they are little different uh, from each other in the sense of what they connect and at what level they connect so I'll come to uh, the concept of the layers in a networking concept of something known as the OSI model of networking but for the moment please understand and appreciate the fact that some of these uh, connectivity tools or devices actually connect at the physical layer which is the lowest le level or it could be at the application level which is the highest level or level 7 or layer 7 or some could be on multiple la layers as for example if you see the gateway actually operates from anywhere ranging from layer 4 to layer 7 we'll see what these layers are in some time now once the physical connections are established it's actually nothing but uh, taking a piece of information breaking it into packets directing these packets to a given address known as the 
IP when you use the TCP IP protocol typically, which is very popular anyways. So if the IP of a particular device is known and it is put as part of the packet, the packet gets directed along the path to the right uh, machine. And that is something which uh, is done through various protocols. And these protocols are known as the methods for handshaking among multiple computers. The OSI model which I referred to, which actually talks about the various layers, conceptual layers uh, at which the communication really seems to happen is one very well, well known or popular model which explains how networking really works. This is akin to, for example, if you had a message to be sent across to your friend, uh, what you would typically do, write the message on a piece of paper, put it into an envelope, give that envelope to, let's say, the courier. The courier in turn puts another envelope with a direction saying that if the uh, letter is supposed to go to, say, Pune, then he will direct it first to the hub in Mumbai, and from the hub it has to go to the Pune hub, and from the Pune hub it goes to the actual destination. Now, for this transport to be enabled, multiple envelopes are put one on top of the other. These are concepts of layers. And when you send a message, you have just sent it on one piece of paper. They have put it in an envelope. Somebody else puts another bigger envelope on top of it, so on and so forth. And at the other end, each envelope is removed in turn till finally you reach the lowest level, which is actually the message itself. Uh, so you'll find, for example, uh, there are uh, various layers here. At the top level, you find the application layer. So I'm actually sending an email message to somebody, for example. So email is an application. So the email application sends data at a, and conceptually that's what it is we are trying to say. And at the other end, you need to expect to get an email at that place. Now, how is this information presented to the application is the other question. So when I send an email from here, it goes to the other end. Is that other email server or email software capable of understanding the manner in which the data is presented to it is a question to ask. So now we are talking about communication at the app next level, which is the presentation level. And going beyond that, when the actual communication between the two is really happening, it's known as a session. So when I'm just now hooked on to the other computer on a network, it is essentially saying that this is the session which is currently on and any communication or packets which are transferred at this moment is to be construed as part of my message which I'm sending right now. Transport is really speaking about end-to-end -end, uh, connectivity. And then you have the network which is in between a variety of uh, nodes that it goes through, that's the network layer. Then you have the packets of communication which is actually the equivalent of the message that we discussed. And that message is something which is now broken into small pieces, which are known as packets. And the packets are then packed, uh, uh, built into frames. And they are actually at the ground level. They are nothing but electrical signals or electronic signals or bits or zeros and ones. So streams of zeros and ones are actually sent on a physical wire. And that's layer zero of the entire uh, or layer one of the entire network diagram. So if you see, logically, you have uh, bits. And at the other end, these bits are received. They are put into frames. The frames, in turn, are built into packets. Packets are then viewed from an end-to-end -end perspective for the entire transport. And then they are presented to the application in a manner which the application understands. The application, in turn, reads the data and makes sense of the thousands of packets which have arrived to constitute a complete email, which we sent in the first place. How do you classify networks is the next big question. And uh, there are a variety of ways that you classify networks. One of them is, of course, geographical in the sense that are you talking of a network within your own building, which is known as the LAN? Or are you talking about a metropolitan area network, which is essentially within the city, that's the MAN? Or are you tra trying to, let's say, an ICICI bank having offices in all over this uh, country at various cities trying to connect with each other? That's a wide area network, which is across cities and across geographies. So geography is one way of looking at networks because technologies change as you increase the uh, geography. For example, it's not the same technology which works within your campus versus across cities, for example. So you need appropriate technologies to enable that. 
the topology is the other uh, key concept and the variety of topologies. Topology essentially is the manner in which the uh, uh, entire layout looks like of a network. And there are some which we are commonly discussed, some known as bus and star, and we'll look at uh, some of them as we go ahead. Switching. Now information is switched in a network in a manner that it is transported across it. And switching therefore becomes an important uh, means of differentiating networks. Primarily there are two types of switching arrangements. One which are quite well known in the telephone circuits that we are familiar with. So when you lift a phone, actually there's a continuous session which you connect with the other person at the other end. And you're sort of blocking an entire path for yourself exclusively. And therefore this is known as circuit switch. The entire circuit is switched to meet your requirements. On the other hand, a public internet, for example, where millions of people are sending information simultaneously and the internet caters to all of them simultaneously. There's no fixed path. There's no blocking of channel exclusively for you. And what is switched in this case is a packet of information. So the message that you send and the message that somebody else is sent when somebody else is sent is actually broken into several packets. And these packets are sent as per the route available at that point of time, whichever is a free route. At the other, other end, the device at the other end actually assembles back these packets, forms the message and forwards it to the user of that message or consumer of that message. So switching technology has a huge impact in terms of performance, speed of transport, the kind of uh, flavor that you get uh, in terms of communication, etc. Networking is on the basis of handshaking as we discussed and protocols are a very important aspect of networking. So protocols differentiate various networks. So there's a time when companies like digital, companies like IBM, companies like HP had created their own networking standards and their own protocols which will allow com computers manufactured by them to communicate with each other. However, with the popularity of standardized internet protocols known as the TCP IP uh, suite of protocols, it has become almost like a de facto standard protocol which is acceptable across. This makes networks interoperable. So you find that whether your company has a network or somebody else's company has a network, they're more or less on the same platform which is the TCP IP platform, making it very easy for packets to be transferred across networks. The other, of course, is the manner in which the physical medium on which the transmission happens. Is it a wire? Is it a VSAT or what is it? And that differentiates how networking is. So there are many other ways potentially that you can classify, but these are some fundamental ways of classification. So let's look at uh, the switching and how different forms of switching uh, facilitate different kinds of networks. So one, like I mentioned, is a circuit switch, uh, which basically is like the telephone network where we allocate a specific path uh, between the sender and the receiver, thereby making it very uh, high performance in a sense because you're dedicating a complete path reserved exclusively for that communication. Therefore, for where you need guaranteed service levels, sometimes circuit switched networks are far efficient in that sense. Uh, but on the other hand, from a practical point of view, because you have so much of bandwidth available on the network, unless you are able to fully utilize the bandwidth, if you dedicate a path, it gets wasted because how much of data can you pump in as one individual? And therefore, it's practical to actually have multiple or thousands and hundreds and millions of people actually send data on the same path. And now how do you make that uh, possible? Uh, if multiple people are going to use the same communication pipe and therefore one mechanism evolved is that of packet switching. So why not take each person's information and packetize it into standardized length packets and then ship those packets on the common path. So you can very well imagine that my packet might be traveling and your packet might be following that and another packet of mine could be traveling after that, so on and so forth. And this is how packet switching actually happens. Also what happens is the path between you and me may not be a single path. There could be many nodes on the network possible on particularly on the internet, for example. So one ridiculous example to give is one of the packet actually travels all the way to US and comes back to India to a building next to me. While another packet finds at that point of time that the servers find or the router finds that the traffic on that route is very less and therefore it's able to directly send the packet 
from my building to the next building. So you can imagine one packet went all the way to US and came back and the other packet actually went directly from my building to his building. Now this is theoretically quite possible and quite likely to happen in a packet switch network. But what happens at the other end is somebody therefore has to consolidate all the packets that they re receive, create that entire information that I sent from here and compile it and then present it to the application at the other end. So that application could be an email or it could be just a display of information right on the browser, so on and so forth. But this is therefore the most popular way of sending because that's the most practical way of sharing bandwidth and completely utilize the, the bandwidth. But the sad part of it is this does not therefore enable you to guarantee service levels because if some packet is lost while transferring from London to India back, it could quite happen. Therefore, the packet has to be resend and resend until it actually reaches at the other end. Now, if this is going to take time, therefore, you can't give a performance guarantee on it. What you can give, however, is a guarantee in terms of the amount of bandwidth that you can provide. Uh, there is one third method of, uh, if you call it that, in terms of switching, which is a peer-to-peer -peer networking. So there's no assumption of a server in uh, this. There's no switching really where you can directly identify the IP of a machine and talk to that machine directly. You can access the drive of that machine, you can access data on that machine, etc. So even in Windows, for example, you can create a small Windows-based network, which is basically a peer-to-peer -peer network. One of the machines can act as a server, if you like, and or as a monitor of the network, or all the machines could actually be equally uh, uh, equipped to become monitors of something. Now, peer-to-peer -peer is you'll find something quite common, particularly in uh, certain things like music sharing sites, etc., where two machines, you don't necessarily have to go through a server, but you go directly to that site and access information stored there on the hard disk of that machine. Now, one of the benefits of peer-to-peer -peer system is that it's almost like uh, hundreds of computers which are equal and they are parallel, they are peers, they are like teams and they are cap equally capable of doing things. They act as servers, but they also act as clients simultaneously. And therefore, you could potentially run an application which can partially run on all these. So this is almost similar to parallel computing, but it's not exactly parallel computing. Because here again, there's no notion of a single server as it happens in parallel computing. Uh, now, the only problem there is, there is a possibility that uh, if one of the nodes is not working, then you can obviously assign the work to some other node in that case. So there's a huge amount of fault tolerance. Uh, but this is usually used in a very limited manner. It's not practical to implement a peer-to-peer -peer because of the cabling arrangements required, so on and so forth, to make it very difficult for you to implement a peer-to-peer -peer network on a very large scale. The other major classification of networks is based on topology, but before we talk about topology, just look at the two associated notions. One is what you call as the physical topology, the physical layout in terms of where the components are distributed and the logical topology, which is merely a scheme of uh, distributing information within the existing network. So for example, uh, when you have a five-story building and when you do a structured cabling and you do a structured network architecture, what is typically done is you restrict, for example, information flow within the uh, same floor, let's say, assuming they are part of the same department. And uh, this is a notion of a virtual network, virtual LAN or VLAN. And that's a notion of a virtual topology. So you're creating a layout within the same uh, physical space and but you're not doing it by physically restricting connectivity because all the uh, networks on every floor are actually connected to a single backbone which be, might be let's say a fiber optic uh, cable running at giga speeds but you're really logically restricting who can access what and that's an example of a logical topology. Uh, here's an example of what topology means. One, for example, is a scheme known as the bus scheme, where the central bus, which is like a cable, and on which you connect each one of these nodes, probably on the same floor, or uh, can, who can hook up onto that uh, bus. Uh, the bus is terminated at both the ends, and uh, signals are therefore flowing back and forth on the uh, cable, 
but the communication really happens within that bus itself. The bus is controlled by one machine which you dedicate as a server and that ensures that people across the network are able to identify each other and transship messages across to each other. Now the advantage of bus are several in the sense that uh, a, it's a very simple conceptually easy method. You keep drawing the bus and you keep hooking on more machines to it but there's a technical limitations in terms of how long a bus can be depending on the technology being used. The other disadvantage is you have to actually physically lay out the bus uh, because it's a physical medium, a wired medium on which you are trying to implement. Uh, the other disadvantage and a big disadvantage is some part of the link is terminated. For example, it cut, the cable is cut, the entire uh, uh, network comes to a halt. Uh, you look at the other one which is the star network. The star topology is essentially one cent central server to whom you have point to point connections with a uh, end node or a terminal. and. Uh, uh, the star acts as the main uh, controller of the entire network. Uh, so the central machine is uh, really the uh, controller in that case. Now the advantage of this is that uh, you have a direct communication from each node to the star to the server. But unfortunately the problem is that if for example the server fails, the entire network collapses. The third and which is a more redundant network, redundant in the sense that you are more resilient, it is fail safe is what you call as a mesh network. Here I have given an example of a company which perhaps has uh, uh, cities Mumbai, Pune, Delhi and Bangalore as its offices and one way to connect could have been that you declare Mumbai as the central server and make all of them as hubs and connect them to Mumbai. But the problem in that case could be that if Mumbai goes down, everything goes down. Now instead of that a mesh beats that problem where you are saying that all of them are equally powerful servers in their own right. At the same time they have multiple wires connecting each point to point. You can't see the last point actually by mistake but Bangalore and Chennai also should be connected with a cable. Now which means that if the Mumbai to Chennai line fails for some reason, there are enough alternate paths for the information to flow. As a result of which you have guaranteed ban bandwidth 24 by 7 by 365 days because all the lines going down is highly unlikely and therefore this becomes a very useful way of connecting particularly for large companies which are completely dependent on IT. The uh, interesting point in all this is uh, in all networking per se is the manner in which you do cabling. and. Uh, Traditionally, we have been used to having physical cables connect uh, computers and uh, wireless of course to some extent now has removed the need and therefore you have flexible office arrangements, you can change your layouts in the office without having to worry about the cables and wires and all of that. However, just for record's sake, the common way of cabling since there are hundreds of kilometers of cables already laid across the country and within hundreds of offices around. Uh, let's talk about some of the cabling schemes that exist and some of the uh, uh, cabling uh, technologies available with us. So one of them is what is popularly known as twisted pair. You would have seen at home for example on your telephone line there is a small thin pair of wires which are intertwined and they come and hook up to the uh, computer or to the telephone. Now that's a twisted pair which is very popular uh, in the conventional uh, uh, cabling arrangement. A more uh, uh, stronger way of cabling is the coaxial cable which probably affords a better bandwidth than a twisted pair and you will find a lot of that which is uh, particularly in companies etc. when you say that they, you have a cabled arrangement, it's typically a coaxial cable which allows you to do that. And of course in increasingly now you find optical fiber is the method. So whether it's the Reliance uh, who has put up a whole lot of optical fibers across the country or it is VSNL or MTNL who have done that, essentially the purpose is to ensure that you get a huge amount of bandwidth. So it's like saying lakhs of telephone calls can go through the same pipe simultaneously because that's the capacity of a fiber optic cable and therefore becoming extremely powerful. Also in local area networks, you don't have fiber running across the company, 
but what you certainly have like I described if you have a five story building each of the LAN could be a bus uh, arrangement using a coaxial cable or it could be a Wi-Fi for example limited to the floor but at the back end you have a strand, strong fiber optic cable running uh, which has a huge capacity to carry uh, at tremendous high speeds. So all the LANs on every floor are hooked up onto this uh, fiber optic cable at the back end which connects to a giga ethernet switch which in turn connects to the servers of the computer. So therefore all the people sitting on any of the floors can communicate with the server using their local Wi-Fi or local uh, uh, bus cable and then hook onto the uh, ethernet cable at the back end which is a very strong optical cable fiber and then connect to the server in turn. Now this is typically how what they call a structured cabling is done. But look at some of the uh, uh, conventional methods which I just spoke about. So this is a twisted and a untwisted uh, pair, untwisted, unshielded, it's not protected and one of the limitations of twisted pair is a the uh, length limitation but it's also limitation in terms of not being protected adequately. So it's subject to damage, it's subject to inf interference from other signals. For example, if there's some electric motor or something running, there's a good chance that this cable will pick up those uh, frequencies and therefore distort the signals within it. Coaxial cable is the other method which has a copper conductor right at the center and then there's a plastic layer on top which is like an insulator and then above that is a braided metal uh, shield which protects it from physical damage. It also prevents from outside interference of any kind. So th these are therefore sturdier. So for example, if I'm computerizing the entire factory, I need to run a cable which is a coaxial cable running across the factory which is more sturdier. You can have a shielded cable in addition which protects further in terms of uh, mm, uh, interference. Fiber optic is uh, the new method of doing things and fiber optic cable is basically a, a laser beam which is passed, uh, light beam which is passed right through a glass tube and uh, light as you know flows ex extremely straight and there can be no distortion in that. And uh, there's a mirror coating around the entire glass tube and therefore no light is actually sent out of the tube so there's no loss of energy at all. This makes it possible for us to actually transport a huge amount of information through a single uh, laser beam or a single fiber optic cable. Here you will notice uh, how the maximum length differs depending on the type of uh, cable that you have. For example, the unshielded twisted pair will allow you only up to 100 meters while the thin coaxial will allow you 185 meters of continuous length. You can of course boost it with repeaters and uh, continue it but uh, these are typical uh, single segment lengths that we are talking about. Then you have thick coaxial cables which allow you up to 500 that's half a kilometer of uh, connection and look at fiber optic which can take you to almost two kilometers of length without much repeat and uh, boosting. Uh, so therefore you will find as you go ahead the choice of the cable makes a lot of difference in terms of the distance that you want to. It also affects cost of course so you need to choose an appropriate uh, model for cabling depending on the distance that you want to carry the information to. Increasingly now however cabling is being done away with for simple reason that there is a huge amount of effort in installing the cable then detecting problems in the cable anywhere if it gets cut or some such thing. Even rodents could eat into a cable for example uh, and interference is the other thing which we talked about and therefore it's important that you have something which is very easy to install uh, without doing any civil work for example which you need in a physical cable laying. Wireless LANs have therefore become extremely popular. What you now need is uh, from the server end you need a conventional LAN up to a point and at some point you can put what they call as a uh, wireless access device uh, which is shown there between the two computers. The wireless access device is nothing but a transmitter which sends or beams or broadcasts the signal across that entire area and any computer in that vicinity can pick up that signal and start interacting 
through that signal with the servers which are on the conventional LAN. So you still need very much a LAN or at least a wireless card on a computer which enables you to hook on through a Wi-Fi circuit, a Wi-Fi signal which is broadcasted by uh, the uh, wireless access device. So you would have noticed for example in many buildings, many classrooms, many uh, rooms that you visit a small device with a two antenna on top of it that is typically an example of a wireless uh, access device. Now there are various standards of wireless and uh, on the last line if you notice there are 802.11b or uh, 11g for example and the speeds are different, the standard and interconnectivity requirements are different. So when you buy a laptop you ask which are the standards it support. Typically most laptops will say that they support multiple types of standards. So it will say A, B, G, all of them for example and you would want to buy a laptop with that because depending on where you go if a particular standard of Wi-Fi has been implemented then your computer should be able to access that uh, network as well. The advantages of Wi-Fi in a campus are very obvious now. So no civil work, no cabling, no uh, pain in terms of disturbing people around you uh, and simply by using either a laptop or a smart device like a smartphone you are able to hook on to the Wi-Fi and the internet access that is provided by the campus or the institution. And more importantly now work becomes any place, any time. So you could be sitting in the corridor, you could be sit chatting up in your canteen and still be able to access information straight. This therefore emphasizes productivity. So for example you are in the midst of a meeting, you want to access something to check for some information, you immediately throw open the information to the rest of them in the meeting and you are able to take a decision and close the issue there itself. Now this kind of a productivity benefits is something which Wi-Fi can enable. Uh, for record's sake, uh, you must also know about telephone systems and uh, the plain old telephone systems or pots as they are called are the old conventional analog telephones with a very low bandwidth. So of course you use uh, telephone for communication, for data communication particularly sometimes. For dial up for example when you connect uh, through your phone to for an email. Uh, but please note that the speeds are extremely slow and they are limited to 52 kbps. So that is a very relatively slow speed that what you expect now. Uh, you also get digital phones now and you will find in offices for example you have those touch tone phones. Some of them may even have a screen where you can see the person who is speaking, video phones as you call them and they typically run on high speed digital lines which are provided by the likes of VSNL and MTNL etc. But you could also optionally connect to what is known as the ISDN or FDDI which enable you to even do video chats and such things directly on the phone. Now, VSAT is the other technology which is quite popular and has been popular. One of the best examples of VSAT applications dating back to at least uh, 10 to 15 years ago was the National Stock Exchange. So while the National Stock Exchange was being set up, they realized the fact that it is extremely difficult to take stock exchanges to the countryside to the rural areas, to the smaller towns and cities because physical telecom bandwidths were very limited at that time, point of time. So what is the fastest way of setting up a network which is pan India and makes possible for a broker to be sitting anywhere and connecting to the national stock exchange? The fastest way was a VSAT. So VSAT is essentially a small aperture typically two and a half meters to three meters kind of a terminal which is like a dish antenna which can sit on top of your building and then you connect it back to a transceiver or uh, device where you can collect and uh, send information and then that you hook on to your computer. So you are self-sufficient in terms of communication no matter where you are. Another good example of uh, where uh, VSATs have been extreme, extremely popularly used have been setting up ATMs in odd spots you know where there is no communication line available really or telecom circuits are available. So you will find ATMs in uh, small towns etc. The fastest way again to set up is a VSAT. Now the biggest advantage of VSAT is that uh, it is not a dish antenna which is something which is easily disturbed. So you have a very re reliable signal and the signal goes all the way up to a satellite and it is beamed to a hub 
and then beam back to the satellite again and send to the destination device which is receiving it. So for example, when you swipe a credit card if you, or let's say you do a transaction with the ATM or your PIN has to be validated, the computer can directly send through the VSAT to the destination and get back the approval of your card or your uh, PIN code and therefore be able to validate you on the spot. So the speeds are fairly good uh, and therefore VSATs have become extremely popular. ISDN, since I referred to, let me make a brief mention about what ISDN is. So when you are talking about digital uh, circuits and digital telephone lines, basically one of them is the ISDN, which is an integrated services digital network, which enables both voice and data and video, for example, to be sent on the same telephone cable. Now you get a fairly good speed as well. And uh, therefore, ISDNs are particularly popular where you are doing video conferencing, for example, between two fixed locations. If you have a leased line or sometimes even a dial-up uh, line for ISDN, uh, you can do video conferencing between two places. And the advantage of going digital is because in analog signals, for example, you've seen on telephones, sometimes you get uh, mixed calls, you know, you get jumbled uh, calls coming to you. You get a distortion, for example, if the telephone at either end is not okay, because the, they work on typically uh, uh, DC uh, current, and therefore DC is very susceptible to uh, interference of various kinds. Whereas if you look at a pure digital signal, it is encoded, and the encoding makes it very difficult for any interference to actually uh, disturb it in any way. So less amount of distortion is a huge advantage, particularly for video conference because you know you feel a jitter coming in you don't like it and therefore you need a good communication medium for doing it and ISDN is a good example of that.